Greetings everyone, hey, how you doing? It's Matt Sella. Today I am doing a spoiler review for the part two segment of Disenchantment, a Netflix series created by Matt Groening. As a reminder, folks, this is a spoiler talk kind of review. I will be talking about some things that I like, some things I didn't like regarding the part two of the Disenchantment season one lineup. Now, I did originally promise in my DuckTales spoiler talk that I might do a season one revisited or kind of like a recap because I previously talked about the part one of the series before, but on a different channel. But I figure most of you who are kind of new here don't really know my opinion on it. I was going to do a whole recap of it to see if it still kind of holds up based off my opinion that I gave a while ago. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish season one in time until the new episodes dropped. So I pretty much marathoned from the beginning to the end, including part two. But before I get into any of that, be sure to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy my content. Ring that bell to be notified when videos drop. And I say, let's begin. Let me give you a quick assessment of what I originally thought of part one. Now, I know this is kind of confusing, but technically what we got is the entirety of season one. It was originally greenlit for 20 episodes for the first season. And we got part one, which is the first 10 episodes a while ago. And recently we got the remaining 10 episodes to finish off season one. Netflix is a little strange when it comes to their season stuff. So right now on their service, they just call it part one and part two. And we're pretty much going to talk about both those parts as they are season one. Now, originally, some of the criticism that people gave Disenchantment, at least part one of the first 10 episodes, they didn't think it was good as, say, Futurama, one of the legendary shows, which I personally love that show. My background is I haven't really grew up with The Simpsons too much. Like, I would catch their episodes maybe like once in a while when I got back from school, but it just didn't really encapsulate me at the time, more so than maybe like South Park did, where South Park really pushed the level of humor and all that stuff. But Futurama, that was a little different. There was just something about it that really grabbed me. I guess it was all part of like how driven the characters were rather than like the satirical situations they may be put in. Unique, charming characters, all that kind of stuff. Witty dialogue, good writing, commentary on like where the future could take us or things that we're doing now that might be the same in the future. There was just a lot of intelligence behind Futurama and I loved it for that. Now, Disenchantment was getting some of that, I'm not going to say backlash, but just heavy criticism that it wasn't quite on par with where Futurama left off. And personally, my opinion at the time was I don't think this show was meant to be Futurama. It's its own genre. It's its own time setting. It has its own lore that it follows. And I don't think it has to be similar to Futurama or even The Simpsons. And I believe the writers and the creator himself know that. That's what they were going for. But a lot of people want more Futurama and were probably disappointed with the kind of humor and setting or writing of the character that this show offered. So I guess what I'm saying is like, if you go in with those pre-expectations, you are most likely going to be let down. Me personally, I actually really enjoyed Disenchantment. It was different than Futurama. I like the characters. I like the style and the attention to the backgrounds. Like I'm a big fan of how the backgrounds are made in this. I think the production is really strong. It's animated by the same company, Rough Draft Studios in Korea. It's actually the same company that animated episodes of Futurama. And what was interesting about part one is that it was telling an arc of a story within the first 10 episodes. And that was a bit different than it was for Futurama, because Futurama, it's episodical. It's kind of like the adventure of the week kind of thing. It gave you like fun, like random little situations that are inconsequential to previous episodes. They're just bite-sized fun stories for us to follow. Whereas in Disenchantment, at least part one, was all about like, kind of like, continuing off of where Bean, Lucy, and Elfo, their adventures took them and what next adventure will follow after that. So while I wasn't like totally engrossed or captured right away by the charm of Disenchantment Part 1, I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it and I was quite curious to see where Matt Groening would take this. Now on to Part 2. And remember folks, this is a spoiler review, so spoilers ahead! You have been warned! Now, the series kind of started off pretty good, in my opinion, part two, that is. However, after we got through the whole Maru Kingdom arc, the show started to become more like Futurama, which is ironic because I say that 
Part one had an arcing story, a consequence to each other. In this one, after we dealt with the queen who has returned from being turned to stone, suddenly tricked Bean to come into the kingdom of Maru, which I might be mispronouncing because I remember when the text came up, it's M-A-R-U. I was like, Maru? But I think the queen pronounced it differently. But anyway, the point is, there was like some weird cult thing going on where Bean had to put on this crown to help pay the debt to hell or something. And at the same time, Elfo, who sacrificed himself, left for dead to resurrect Bean's mom. Bean wanted to find a way to bring Elfo back. And the reluctant yet helpful Lucy came up with a couple ways of how that could happen. Hence going straight to hell to try to bring Elfo's soul back to the living and hopefully resurrect him that way. After all that was done, that's when the series started to go into this more bite-sized, episodical show, which I liked, yes, and I'm not saying each episode bear no consequence to each other. There were times where the elves and King Zog managed to make amends to help save the people who have been turned to stone in Dreamland, and the elves kind of moved in, created their own little district. I think after that point, that's when a lot of the episodes started to become more like bite-sized adventures. And they were fun. I will admit, they were fun. And kind of going back to what other people said in reviews, yes, I will admit, like, the humor is not laugh out loud or witty compared to, like, say, Futurama. But I really try not to compare different source materials or even adaptations of source materials to a film or show. But yes, no, I'll admit, like, I wasn't laughing as much as I would like to, but I still found the characters quite charming. I mean, especially Lucy, Bean's personal little demon, where there are points where I'm like, yeah, he's supposed to make Bean's life a living hell, because, I mean, that's the whole point of that's why he was assigned to her. But throughout the episode, despite his bad boy persona, he does really care for her, as well as Elfo, even though he won't quite admit it. And I think things really perked my interest, which is the second to last episode, episode nine, I believe, I could be wrong, but that's the episode where Bean goes to Steamland, kind of the more advanced almost Bioshock-like setting of like steampunk Victorian England kind of thing. And it's kind of funny, last uh, DuckTales discussion video I had with Mark, we brought up a comment about Jules Verne and shooting to the moon thing. I love the fact that Steamland had a lot of like connections to Jules Verne as well, but also there was like a couple fun little Easter eggs in there. I'm sure some of you caught it where Beam was trying to find the Dragon Man, as I believe she called him, and one of the civilians instructed her, or at least she was looking for Farnsworth Boulevard or something like that. And I was like, ah, yeah, Professor Farnsworth. And then the civilian said, oh, yeah, it's in the transport district. You know how Farnsworth from Futurama had the Planet Express? It transports packages to people. I don't know. Maybe that was just an amazing coincidence, but I kind of like that little Easter egg to Futurama. And also there were a couple of times where Zog recited some lines similar to what Bender would say, considering that John DiMaggio not only played the voice of Bender, but also plays the voice of King Zog, which I think is hilarious because King Zog actually kind of looks a lot like John DiMaggio. I think that's great. Like you guys probably remember the time when he went off to battle and at first he had cold feet, but then he suddenly had that drive and said, bite my shiny metal axe. And I was like, <laughs> that's great. And then in a later episode, he was in the theater waiting for this controversial play to begin. And he didn't quite say it the same way as Bender. But when he said, let's go already or whatever like that, I was like, oh, that's a nice little callback to Bender. I miss Bender. But yeah, to conclude on Steamland, I just really like the art direction they went there. It was a lot of fun. And I love those kind of clashes of time period things going on because Bean obviously comes from like a 13th century style medieval evil fantasy world where Steamland is all about the science. And I love science. So I'm always curious to see how these mythical legend setting characters kind of clash with the scientificalness or the sci-fi elements. I don't know, things like that. I love that. And I wish it was more of that on TVs and movies. But anyway, that was fun, but it was kind of short-lived. Bean eventually made it back to Dreamland, but because she came in a weird ship and brought a gun with her, which everyone thinks is some kind of killing wand or a hammer wand, gets set up for a coup 
or whatever you call it, taking down the king in a weird way, secret society and all. And I think it was like the last two episodes. That's when we really started to get back into the whole overarc system. But before I conclude on this review here to kind of give you my assessment and all that, I think the thing that I really enjoy about the series, and again, maybe I'm just being a hypocrite saying like, oh, I'm not going to use Futurama as a means to critique a show or anything like that. But I'm just really happy that Matt Groening brought back the familiar cast he had from Futurama into the series. Yet again, you had John DiMaggio playing King Zog, as well as a couple other random characters. But then you got the legendary Tress McNeil, who plays Queen Una, which I loved her arc in this story, actually. Many other characters like the fairy... And just some of the more elderly ladies, even the witch at one point. And of course, you can't go without talking about Maurice LaMarche playing Oddvel, the prime minister of Dreamland. And so many other characters, I just love hearing that man's voice. Billy West, you can't forget about him playing Sorcerio, the wizard, as well as the Gesture and many other characters. Lauren Tom made a few appearances throughout the series. And even Phil Lamar, speaking of the Dragon Man, I believe Phil Lamar played the guy's voice, as well as a few other characters. So I guess what I'm saying is I love the fact that we're getting these veteran voice actors to continue playing in roles like this. But yeah, as I've mentioned before, I think Lucy is one of my favorite characters. I just like his sassy remarks and his kind of mean-spirited, but in a weird way, he knows when to give attention to people who need it, or at least his friends Bean and Elfo. And I love the fact that he actually sacrificed a lot in order to save them many times, especially how that's dressed in the end, where he's not actually quite immortal as he claims to be, because he gave up all his powers just to get them out of hell. Which I did think at the beginning, I thought it would be kind of cool where if they actually did scale up Lucy and try to explain that later on in Dreamland, it's like, oh, now he's, instead of like being like the size of a cat, he's like the size of an old kid or something. And I was like, oh, he has wings now. That's weird. But no, he went back to being like a small old guy. But overall, I say I was very entertained by this. I still am not going to go on the bandwagon where I'm saying like, oh, it's good as Futurama or it's worse than Futurama. It's not Futurama. I know that. It's its own thing and I appreciate it for that. It was still kind of fun to watch. I'll probably watch it again, maybe in the future. And when the next season drop, or at least part one of the next season drops, if that ever happens, I'm definitely jumping on that. It's a very entertaining show. Probably not my favorite show on Netflix right now, but again, it's something I look forward to. So yeah, entertained. That's what I'm going with. So that'll do it for my review here. But what's important right now is I want to hear your opinion on the Disenchantment Part 2 series on Netflix. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Let me know in the comment section below, share your thoughts, join the conversation. And if you enjoyed reviews just like this one, please consider subscribing to my channel, ring that bell when you want to know when videos drop, and if you want to support me further, please consider going to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Matt Sella. There you can donate as little as a dollar a month, will help go towards my podcast, art, animation, content made just for you. Links in the description below. As I like to say here folks, this is Matt Sella, thanking you all for tuning in.